Good evening. Welcome to the June 19th uh, Planning Board meeting. Uh, I'd like to hold off the beginning of the meeting for a few minutes to let the members review some of the correspondence that's come in since our packet arrived. So if you'll excuse us a minute, uh, we'll be continue our meeting shortly. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Has everybody had uh, enough yes. time? Yes, okay. thank you. All set. 
Okay. Um, continuing the meeting, uh, the minutes of the previous meeting uh, in front of you. Is there uh, any comments or revisions? Uh, if not, uh, make a motion to approve. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Do I hear a second? Second. Second's been made. All those in favor, show by the right, raising the right hand. Uh, we have correspondence uh, this evening that arrived in our packets, uh, plus the following uh, also that uh, we re received this evening. We have a letter from the town manager regarding uh, Richmond Island boat dock. Um, we have the uh, community set of planning committee minutes, uh, summary of census data on age distribution in Cape Elizabeth, planning commissioner's uh, journal spring 2001, Zoning news for 2001, planning board memorandum regarding the BA district zoning amendment that was uh, sent to the town council. A letter from Mr. and Mrs. Taylor regarding St. Bart subdivision. We've uh, received a letter from uh, uh, Phyllis Cogshell regarding uh, 360 Ocean House Road. <coughs> We've received a letter from Natalie Burns of Jensen, Baird, Gardner, and Henry uh, regarding Ocean House Road. Um, we've received a letter from RF Haffenreffer, the fourth, uh, regarding the project at 340 Ocean House Road. We've received a letter from Ms. Mr. Hill, the uh, town attorney, regarding the subdivision plan that is in front of us this evening uh, by Eric T. and Lisa Hansen. We've received a um, memorandum from, or a copy of a memorandum that went to uh, Mr. McGovern regarding the uh, hearing on his historic ordinance. Um, we've received a letter from Candace Thornton Lee um, regarding the 45-day uh, waiting period on our project uh, the, on this evening's uh, historic resource zoning amendment. Uh, we've re received a letter from Hillary Bassett, who represents the great important landmarks regarding uh, the historic preservation subject tonight. Um, we've received a letter from Lois H. Nichols regarding the uh, development at St. Bartholomew's Church. And we've received a letter from um, Claudia and Martin Finkelstein regarding the same subject at St. Bartholomew's Church. On the agenda this evening, the uh, first item on our agenda is the uh, Blue Stone Corp Earth Materials Permit Renewal. Uh, Mr. Murray, if you'd like to step forward and bring us up to date. My name is Leland Murray, requesting the annual permit for Bluestone Corporation located at 1019 Sawyer Road. It's a rock quarry operation. Um, I've walked the perimeter. To my knowledge, there's no holes in the fence. Um, I've replaced the signs that the lovely children take down each year as a token of their pledge. Uh, and to my knowledge, there's been no complaints from the neighborhood. discussion at this point regarding the completeness. Mr. Chair, go ahead. John. Sorry. The, the quarry activities, could you just point to where they have been over the last year? Right in this area right in here. Concerns about completeness of his request. 
Mr. Chairman, this application is the same as we've seen every year for perhaps the last 10. Uh, I move that we deem the application complete. Motion's been made. Uh, is there any second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Uh, any discussion? If not, uh, all those in favor of the completeness motion, uh, please show by raising the right hand. Carries seven to zip. Um, at this point, uh, a normal procedure is to open it to a public hearing. At this time, I'll uh, welcome any citizen or anybody that would like to say something on the uh, subject at hand. Please step forward. Seeing none, then uh, I will close the hearing. Uh, is there any other discussion that the board would like to entertain at this time regarding this project? Mr. Chairman, I have a question of the uh, town planner. Uh, considering the numerous efforts we've made this year to rewrite, change, and consider proposed changes to the town ordinances, would it be something that would be extremely difficult uh, to change our ordinance to allow a two-year permit on an operation such as this, uh, putting a qualifier on it that after the first three years of operation, the planning board may have the option of issuing two-year permits rather than one? It's the same process that you would go through for any amendment. It's the planning board would have to hold a public hearing and then would have to go to the council and the council would have to hold a public hearing before they could consider adoption. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Murray, I hope you realize that much as we'd like to, as uh, Peter's alluding to, we're currently prohibited from approving a permit for longer than one year. So we'll see you about 12 months from now. <laughs> tonight as well. <laughs> no other discussion. Uh, would somebody uh, want to make a motion at this point? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. Motion for the board to consider findings of fact. One, the applicant operates Bluestone Quarry located at 1019 Sawyer Road. Two, this facility requires a special permit to remove earth materials under section 19-8-5. Three, the facility will conduct blasting and transport operations which could endanger the public health, safety, and welfare. Four, the applicant has substantially addressed the earth material permit requirements in section 19-8-5D. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Leland Murray for renewal of an earth materials permit at the Bluestone Quarry located at 1019 Sawyer Road be granted by the Planning Board for a one-year period beginning June 20, 2001 and ending with the regular June 2002 meeting of the Planning Board subject to the following conditions. One, the applicant shall maintain a fence at least three feet in height around the perimeter of the site. Two, the applicant shall maintain comprehensive general public liability insurance with coverage not less than $500,000 per person and per occurrence for bodily injury or death, and not less than $100,000 per occurrence for property damage. Three, no operation shall be conducted at the quarry on Saturdays, Sundays, or holidays except that stone may be loaded and trucked from the site on Saturdays. No machinery or equipment shall be operated before 8 a.m. or after 6 p.m. on any day, except that loading of trucks shall only take place between 7.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Four, all blasting shall be performed by or under the direct personal supervision of a person qualified, experienced, and regularly engaged in such work, and shall be done in a manner which will not endanger the health or safety of any person or damage any real or personal property on or off the quarry site. Representatives of the applicant shall be present at the time of the blasting operation. Five, the applicant shall keep accurate records of any and all blasting operations, including times and dates of such operations, and information on size and placement of all charges. The schedule for any blasting and drilling shall be submitted by the applicant to the public safety dispatcher at least seven days prior to the commencement of the work. The schedule shall include the name of the drilling and or blasting subcontractor who will perform the work and a certificate of insurance for such subcontracting. Drilling and blasting shall be scheduled for no more than one half day at a time. Six, the applicant shall make a reasonable attempt to notify Cape Elizabeth residents along Sawyer Road and Silman Street in the vicinity of the quarry prior to any blasting operation. Seven, no more than 10,000 cubic yards of material shall be removed during the term of this permit. 
Eight, if the code enforcement officer finds at any time that the health, safety, or welfare of area residents or property is threatened by quarry operations, he or she is authorized and directed to order that all work at the site be suspended immediately and to require that operations be resumed only after further action by the planning board. Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Charles seconded. Uh, is there any discussion regarding the motion? Hand? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor are show by raising the right hand. Uh, motion carries. For another year, Mr. Murray. The uh, second uh, item on our agenda this evening is the uh, request by Sprague Corporation for site plan review of a boat dock to be built on Richmond Island. Mr. Chairman, as discussed in prior workshop on this subject, I'll recuse myself. Is, uh, is there any uh, discussion, any reason why we can't allow that? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Maureen. My name is John Green. I'm representing the Sprague Corporation along with Phineas Sprague, Jr. We're here to request site plan review for a seasonal boat dock to be constructed on Richmond Island. I have outlined for you in my memo of May 25th the applicable shoreland performance standards as well as the site plan review submission requirements. Several members of the board have had an opportunity to discuss this proposal with us in workshop earlier this year. I believe this is a reasonably straightforward request, uh, self-explanatory, and uh, Phineas, and, Phineas and I would be happy to entertain questions uh, regarding this application. Unless you would like us to go through each specific item or uh, go through the specific aspects of the dock, we'll just uh, defer to your requests. Um, John, I think we have a list of the uh, the uh, completeness items here, and I, I bring it to the attention of the board if they had any questions regarding these. Um, and we'll look at it from a completeness standpoint, and then we'll get into the rest of the subject. Questions regarding the completeness? Mr. Chairman, hearing no questions, I have a motion to consider. Yes, sir. Motion for completeness, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Sprague Corporation for site plan review and compliance with shoreland zoning standards for construction of a boat dock on Richmond Island be deemed complete. Motion is made. Uh, do we hear a second? Second. Mr. Serraldo has seconded. Is there any further discussion? If not, uh, all those in favor of the motion show by raising the right hand. Motion carries. Now we'll get into uh, <coughs> um, further discussion on uh, the application. Could you describe the project a little more for us and, and get into some of the particulars? I'll have Phineas uh, Sprague get the particulars of the uh, technical aspects of the dock. Thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, basically what this is is a floating dock, 40 feet long and 10 feet wide about 400 square feet. It's uh, approximately 20 feet off the ledge uh, and held in place by two piles. It's a uh, galvanized surface with uh, grating on it. Uh, the, there's a 40-foot ramp that goes up to uh, uh, a walkway 
again made of the same material that goes 40 feet over to the base of an old road that came down to the original uh, dock area, wharf area. The, alongside it, there is a, a jib boom with a 16-foot uh, beam on it. The purpose of the jib boom is to, hand, is to be able to lift the uh, ramp off the dock when the weather's bad so that the dock can float freely, and also to bring, uh, to lift it up and to actually bring it up onto the shore in the winter. It's a seasonal dock and it will be out of the water. Uh, uh, it'll be in the water no more than seven months a year to meet the, the compliance standards. Uh, there's approximately eight and a half feet of water under the outboard end and approximately six feet of water under the inboard end at low tide. Um, it'll be held in place by two pilings. The reason why the pilings are there is because with the action on the dock, uh, you break the hinges on the float if you don't really keep it in a single place. So we've opted to have the, the, the piling. Um, the, uh, this walkway area here is uh, simply put on a little concrete uh, uh, forms. Uh, they will be attached to the rock by just a couple of bolts, and it can be removed at a future date. Um, the reason for the orientation is uh, to be into the weather. In other words, when the, when the northwest winds blow in the fall, um, this is a lead shore, and you want to present the uh, smallest end of the dock or the boat uh, into the wind. Is there any other questions? Uh, those uh, pilings are permanent. They're permanent. Yeah. yeah. And and the, whole. <laughs> and the and the hoist is set up so that you take each section of the dock out and with it. Right. In other, in other words, this is a self-contained operation. It can put itself away for the winter. And it's uh, important to be able to lift the. It's really the bad weather that makes it really necessary to be able to lift the ramp up because it will flail around. Pretty hard. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sprague, has anything on the design for this dock changed since we met in workshop? Um, not to my knowledge, no. no. Same point. Okay. Um. One of the uh, items in our packet tonight is discussing the uh, site walk in a public hearing. Is there any thoughts on that at this time? It's just one member, Mr. Chairman. I don't think we'd gain any information uh, by a site walk. Uh, there are no other property owners involved. Richmond Island is totally owned by the Sprague Family Corporation. It doesn't impede on any sight lines from any public access areas. Uh, I've only had the opportunity to be on the island once, but uh, I see no need for a site walk as much as I've enjoyed taking a Saturday morning and driving out there. I kind of agree with you also. Uh, Maureen, have you had any calls regarding this project? No. I, I think I'd recommend also that uh, my, my feeling would be that a site walk and a hearing is uh, counterproductive at this time. Would anybody like to make a motion at this time if you don't have any more questions? a quick question, Mr. Sprague. What's the status of the DEP and Army Corps application? The DEP and, and Army Corps, well, actually, it's a DEP application. It's a permit by rule yeah. the Army Corps, and it's basically a perfunctory after uh, uh, we've gone through the, permits, the permitting process for the town since you're the controlling authority. It has been, it has been designed to conform to their rule. <clears throat> Any further discussion? Well, I guess the next issue we have to get to is whether we want to uh, have a public hearing or entertain the 
Well, I, we did discuss that a minute ago, but I, all the property owners that adjoin this property are Sprague Corporation, I think, yeah. and anybody that has a site view on it. it well, I was going to say, I think for the same reasons that I don't, don't believe the site walk's necessary, I really don't see public hearing being necessary. Right. It should be noted that the Sprague Corporation, the Sprague Family Corporation, has always allowed uh, reasonable public access to the island by responsible people who know how to properly care for it. Uh, this dock is going to allow for ease of access to the island, uh, and it also allows for uh, improved working conditions for the caretaker that's out there. Uh, I see it that uh, actually it's in the public access, it's in the public interest to allow this to move forward. I can't see any negatives to it as far as general population of the greater Cape Elizabeth area. As I see no reason for a public hearing whatsoever. And the board agrees. I'd like to move on as to whether or not we make a motion for approval or not. If you'd like to move along. Then. Mr. Chairman, I have a motion for the board to consider. Findings of fact, the Sprague Corporation is proposing to construct a boat dock on Richmond Island, which requires site plan review and compliance with the shoreland zoning standards. The project will require state and federal permits, which have not yet been issued. Number three, the application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations and section 19-8-2 shoreland zoning regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Sprague Corporation for site plan review and compliance with shoreland zoning standards for construction of a boat dock on Richmond Island be approved subject to the following condition. One, that there be no building permit issued nor alteration of the site until state and federal permits are obtained. Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Uh, hearing no discussion, I present it to vote. All those in favor of the motion made, please show by raising right hand. The motion carries unanimously. We'd like to thank the board for their approval, and uh, we will uh, supply the appropriate permits to town staff uh, when we acquire them. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. The third item on our agenda this evening is the Arvin uh, Seneca condition review requested by Mr. Nemers, representing Tom Tinsman, is requesting planning board review of the center located at 349 Ocean House Road. Did uh, bring us up to date, sir. Uh, we will. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bill Nemers the uh, architect for the applicant. Um, I think you've got the memo that uh, the town planner uh, gave you with respect to this project, and uh, I think that clearly states what the purpose of this uh, uh, thing is. I'd just like to, to make sure that the board understands that we uh, uh, were very particular about keeping the design of the building very close to what was what was approved by the planning board. Um, I think uh, Tom Planner did uh, have one question with respect to the orientation of the entrance, and I uh, reacted to that, I think, uh, by a drawing which I gave to her, and I'm assuming she gave it to each of you. Um, if you could follow me. Um, Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Um, since, since many of you folks were not here when we did this, would it, you think it would be wise just to quickly run through with the thing, or is that reasonable? If you care to, it would help us, I think. Okay. I would give my. The, uh, uh, the building as conceived was to uh, this little piece here is the existing uh, 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 real estate office on the property, and we were trying to add uh, 
a building which has uh, three levels. On the back side would be a level with two uh, retail outlets. Uh, on this level, there would be a, a couple retail things and then some apartments on the upper, three apartments on the upper level. Um, we tried to make this, because we realized this was the first building that was being built in the, in the downtown zone, the uh, town center zone. We wanted to make sure that it was really complied with all the things in order to make a good example, set of good example in that thing. And so we uh, uh, did a lot of the, the zone, the zone regulations are fairly specific with respect to uh, the, the kinds of detailing you're supposed to put on there, like porches and, and, uh, and gables and, and things to make it look <coughs> like it belonged in Cape Elizabeth as opposed to downtown Portland, for instance. Uh, and so we have uh, porches on the front and porches on the back and uh, uh, railings and windows and, and small, smaller scale elements to bring the scale of this thing down to a more uh, something which, which fits in, we think, to the, to the uh, downtown or this town center of Cape Elizabeth. At the time we presented this, uh, we were doing several things. We redoing the front of the existing, or the redoing all the siding in the existing building to match this one so that it looked, when we finished it, it looked like something that all belonged together. Um, and when we presented this to the board, we had um, kind of general information with respect to the window locations and the locations of various things. And, and the board was, uh, was concerned that when this went into the, to the, uh, the code enforcement officer for review that uh, they wanted to make sure that these specific uh, uh, items that were in the town center uh, ordinance were in fact carried through to the, to the building permit stage. And so that, that is what uh, this hearing is to make sure that we did hear what we said we would do here. And uh, one of the, the items which the town planner well, uh, reacted to was uh, that here we had a, uh, a door right at the entrance here. Um, when, we, we, when we did it this time, we had, there was really three doors here. I had one of them on the side wall and a window right in front there, but that's not a big deal. I think the drawing we gave you tonight, I switched them back and forth so that the, the door was right at the end of the entrance there. And we put a little bit more emphasis on the, on the entrance so that it looks more like it's obvious where the entrance is here. Um, we wanted to keep the entrance under the under the roof as opposed to over in here where the roof came off, the rain would come off on, on top of you. So this is really the kind of the traditional place at the, at the corner of the gable end where an entrance to uh, uh, maybe a, a Greek revival or a, a kind of a common main farmhouse uh, entrance appears on the elevation. So that's that's what we have for you. Just make sure that that we have the the elevations uh, done in the right. The materials are exactly the same as we had uh, uh, brought to you before. That is shingle siding, uh, some some wood trim around the edges and around the windows and such. Wood windows, uh, wood railings. Uh, it's it's mostly uh, residential style construction as opposed to uh, commercial, if you will, is most uh, wood materials, uh, and I think that that would will finish what I have to say here. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Um, before we go any further, I'd like to uh, uh, remind the members of the board that there is a copy of the original approval that was issued on April 23rd, 1999, for you to review. And of course, the purpose tonight of this meeting is to make sure that, uh, that nothing has really changed to the exterior of the building that would make us raise uh, further questions. I'd also like to ask the board members that uh, there have been some correspondence to us um, regarding uh, questions that some of the abutters have and that uh, They've requested an opportunity to speak tonight, and I'd like to ask if there's anybody on the board that uh, uh, would disagree with allowing these people to uh, speak this evening. 
And if you have any concerns, uh, bring them up. Otherwise, as chairman, I would like to give them an opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, I'm not sure it's necessary to have another evening for hearings, but if uh, uh, for public hearing, because we already had one. But if uh, uh, you don't mind, I'd like to declare an opportunity for some of these people to speak. So, any comments? I don't have any concern about um, hearing the comments of the abutters, but I just wanted further clarification as to the scope of our discussion tonight. Um, for example, can we ask questions about lighting? Um, landscaping is that's all been approved in the past and that's beyond the scope of tonight's meeting. Um, what is it appropriate to discuss and not? As I understand it, Maureen may want to clarify this a little bit, the purpose of the uh, presentation tonight is to for us to review the exterior of the building uh, to make sure it complies uh, that they'd already been in front of us on the on the structure and have approval uh, and so you might want to double check the approvals here and if you if you weren't here last year when they did this uh, um, you may want to raise some or two years ago you may want to raise some questions just to clarify things in your own mind do you see any other reason to? Well, I, I think the scope, this approval, it's interesting you're mentioning landscaping because other people have mentioned landscaping and um, there are conditions on the approval that required a little bit more information on landscaping and I believe the applicant is working on that. So, um, but that isn't why it's before the board this evening. My, my sense would be that if you had general questions about the site plan, the applicant would just be willing to answer them but the scope tonight is basically just to meet condition number four uh, of the approval granted in April of 99. Thank you. Yes, sir. We'll try to... Any, any thoughts of, uh, of not allowing uh, speakers tonight? Uh, I guess I do have another question then uh, for, for Maureen. Um, Maureen, if, if the issue only concerns the exterior materials and design of the building, then why is the reference in here about the uh, maintenance agreement and has that already been addressed? Or is that different, project. different project. Different project. Different project, okay. That's uh, easy. One other question, though, Mr. Chairman, before we invite uh, discussion. There's reference in one piece of correspondence we received to Superior Court ruling on this project. Uh, and the, the correspondence suggests that the Superior Court has instructed us to review both exterior appearance and landscaping, although the original site plan approval did not require that. Can Maureen, can you or someone else shed light on that piece? Well, not an attorney. Um, we, the town and the applicant were sued, the planning board was sued on this, this approval and the decision of the court upheld the, the approval. One of the basis for their decision was that the planning board still had to review uh, the building permit application to find these other details. I am not aware of any specific thing that the board has been instructed to do other than what you already have in your original approval. Any other question? At this point, if there is anybody in the audience that would like to uh, make a presentation regarding this subject, you're welcome to come to the podium and introduce yourself. Good evening, board members. My name is Natalie Burns. I'm from Jensen Baird Gardner and Henry, and I'm here tonight on behalf of Mrs. Constance Reich, who owns the uh, farm property that directly abuts the proposed project. Um, it would be on the left if you were looking at it from the street. Um, I think that Ms. O'Mara is correct in her statement to you that the Superior Court did not uh, directly order this board to do anything. However, I, I referenced something in my letter that I would like to read to you from the court decision uh, and then explain to you why we think that the issue of landscaping is still to be resolved by this board. 
Um, one of the issues that we raised on appeal was that the town center zoning establishes some very uh, specific standards for what's required for a buffer and for landscaping, particularly of a parking area in the town center zone. Um, and now I'm going to read to you directly from the court's decision, and this will be quite brief. The plaintiff argues that the site plan does not comply with the landscaping requirements of the ordinance, and there's then a reference to the record and to the appropriate um, ordinance provisions. The site plan was approved on the condition, among others, that the building permit application include detailed information that would be approved by the planning board as consistent with design standards. And that's what the court said on the issue of landscaping. Um, one of the reasons that my client decided not to appeal the Superior Court decision was the understanding that this board would be reviewing these design issues when it came back to you for the uh, elements of the building. It was also my client's understanding that you would be taking a look at the landscaping. Obviously, my client had felt that the landscaping that's shown on the original approved plan does not meet the very specific guidelines set forth in your ordinance, but the court said, since it's coming back to you, that issue, our understanding of the court decision is that the court said that, that issue would be looked at at this time. Um, so as a result, it's our opinion that you are looking at the landscaping as well as the building design. And we would ask that you do that, that you look at the specific guidelines set forth in your ordinance about buffering, particularly the buffering of a commercial use from an abutting residential use. There are some very clear standards in your ordinance as to what's required for that. I know you're all familiar with the ordinance, and I'm certainly not going to read it to you tonight. Um, but I would specifically refer you to the landscaping sections uh, B and C and um, remind you that there is a requirement for a, a uh, continuous buffer between these uses and um, the ordinance does not only say what that buffer is supposed to be like, but it also provides you with some clear illustrations. We'd ask you to, to review the plan and make a determination finally as to whether you feel that as presented to you tonight, this plan meets those standards. Um, I, I don't want to take a lot of time tonight, but I did want to address some very specific design issues. Uh, these, these issues all come from the um, town center zoning standards. Um, first of them is the issue of scale. In particular, uh, one, a major issue that we have with this project is how much roof there is that you see on this building and how little broken up that roof is from the front and also, as you would expect would be important to my client, on the left side of the building, I believe you have a left, left elevation, um, you'll note that a lot of that elevation is the existing building and certainly uh, that building is already there and um, is only going to be a glebe shingle. However, if you look at the relationship of the existing building to the new building, there's very little detailing on that elevation of the building. Um, I should say the new structure. Uh, mostly what my client will see and her tenants will see from, from their property, um, if it's built as designed, is a fair amount of roof. Um, I think, in fact, there's only two small windows proposed um, on that elevation in the new building. Uh, in addition to the um, in addition to the question of scale, um, we have concerns about about the uh, the height of the building has been approved, I believe, as has a roof pitch. Um, while we had concerns about that, I think that, that that has been finally decided. We do have some concerns about the um, orientation of the building. I think that um, Ms. O'Mara's comments about having a distinctive entrance, that's something specifically required by the ordinance. Um, and we would ask that the board require that that be provided uh, by this application. I think right now it's, it's somewhat difficult to tell when looking at this exactly where the entrance to the building is um, as you look at it from the street. Um, another another uh, serious concern that we have is the issue of openings. I've already discussed this a little bit in the context of windows, uh, both on the side elevation and in the front, um, I think the first floor elevation um, is fine as to the openings, but as the board knows, openings are supposed to be consistent not only with what's on the site right now, but also with the abutting properties. 
and I would submit to you that the um, dormers that are shown in the roof um, on the front facade are not consistent with the budding properties um, or with any properties in the area. Um, finally, we, as I've mentioned, we do have a concern about landscaping and we do believe that issue is before you tonight. We would ask you to take a look at that and to require that there be um, effective buffering between this property and the abutting residential property. Um, finally, I would note that in looking at these plans, and part of that may be a function of the fact that you can only draw these in two dimensions, there does not appear to be uh, much articulation between the existing building on the site and what's going to be added to it. In fact, if you look at this, um, it looks like one building at this point. The reality is there is an existing building on the site that's actually rather a nice building that's going to get a new exterior finish to it. And there should be some recognition of the fact that this is an existing building and not part of this larger structure. And <clears throat> there should be some sort of detailing to recognize that and pay respect to what's already on the site. And also try to uh, maintain a little bit of the existing residential character of that structure. Um, final issue that, that I would also ask that the board consider is the question of signage. I know that the initial site plan does show some signs on the buildings. It's my understanding from a brief discussion with the code enforcement officer yesterday uh, that as long as those are the only signs that are proposed, or that I should say as long as building signs are the only ones proposed, that um, he, he doesn't have any concerns about anything. Um, I guess I would ask that the board consider placing a condition of approval on this if, if, when you are ready to approve a final design. Uh, that requires any signage changes in location either on or off the building to come back to this board for approval. This is a very prominent site in the town center. This is the first project that's going to be built under the town, town center guidelines in this area and we would ask that the board hold the applicant to the, to the standards that are set forth in the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burns. Appreciate your comments. At this time, is there anybody else who would like to discuss this project? My name is Peter Hoffenberger. I live directly across the street from this project. And I was uh, <clears throat> most interested in the illumination and the hours, whether the, whether the illumination would be cut off at a certain time as far as the, um, uh, as far as the signs go. Um, I have in their uh, in their plans or I haven't heard of any particular um, uh, plans for a, a, a the hours that the uh, signs will be illuminated and so on I don't know whether that's been discussed or not uh, one other question is um, I see on the plan that these mature trees are put on here but if um, the sidewalks and some of the construction that's going on um, goes ahead, I doubt whether most of these trees will survive that type of construction. Um, I, you know, I don't know whether you all have insurances that this will all be left or not. Uh, uh, I, haven't, I haven't heard that discussed. And um, those basically are my concerns. Thank you, Mr. Heffner. Is there anybody else at this time that would like to speak on this subject from the floor? Um, Mr. Nemers, uh, would you care to comment on, on a couple of these issues that may, may put some people's minds at rest? Certainly. Um, take the last comments first and the first one. Um, the, uh, respect to the, to, the, to the trees, yes, we are taking down some of the trees in the neighborhood of the building. But I think we were very, very careful with our landscaping and the, the path of the sidewalk through these trees to be able to, to put the sidewalk. We did not put it in a straight line such that we could chop trees down in there, but we put the path and, 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 uh, and wound it around the trees to make sure that those trees would be, would be there. And so I think we, we tried to save as many of them as we can, including some of the big ones along, uh, along the highway. So I, I think we, 
And um, with respect to the lighting, um, I think there was a, 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 a we have no problem of cutting off. In fact, I think it's probably good business to cut the lighting off at the, at the end of, uh, of uh, the normal day. I don't know, I'm not sure what that, maybe 10 o'clock at night or something, unless the, unless the businesses are going on. There's no reason to keep lighting on all night long, certainly. Um, with respect to some of the other issues, um, uh, when we presented this before the board before, there was quite a bit of discussion about buffering and landscaping. Um, and I think we, we talked very much with the board at that time about uh, putting the plants and buffers and fences between this building and the one next door. And at the time uh, of the approval, uh, you can see there is quite a bit of uh, existing trees along here now. We've added a few more in, in places where there, where there were breaks. Uh, the fence will remain uh, along there. Uh, so I think the, the planning board at the time we presented this before was, kind of, was uh, satisfied that the buffering requirements of the, of the town center zone were, were satisfied. Um, we have, uh, we also gave a lot of uh, consideration to the various uh, materials and, and, and uh, uh, layout and uh, design of the elements on the elevation uh, to make sure that this was a, like I mentioned before, uh, had kind of a small town uh, character that uh, the town center, we think, uh, was supposed to have according to the ordinance. Um, the ordinance did not say that you have to or you should uh, copy from uh, other areas in the, in the, in the, uh, along the street. And in fact, there's a good reason why you don't do that. And there's a, a residence on one side, but that residence is the only building in the rest of the town center until you get way down to across the street here uh, where uh, the kind of qualities of construction you'd want in the town center actually exist. Um, so we, this is really uh, the first, I think, uh, with respect to scale, with respect to the, the kind of uh, windows, the double hung windows in the upper floors and, the, and some lower floors and uh, the small scare character of the, of the railings and that, that we try to make this the kind of a, a first step in the town center zone that was uh, and I think the, town, the, the, the planning board before agreed with us that I mean, we had a lot of conversations with both the town planner and the board as to how this should, should work. And I think we're pretty much on line with it. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. I, I have one question at this point that I would like to ask just for the benefit of everybody here. What is your construction schedule at this time? Um, our construction schedule is uh, to start right away. Um, we've got a few, uh, the project is out to bid several contractors right now. We expect the bids to be in in a couple of weeks and, and we'll make a decision on a contractor and theoretically get started uh, the first of next month. Mr. Chairman? I think uh, one point of clarification that may be helpful both to those of us on the board and to those who are in attendance tonight. The original site plan approval in April of 1999 included a number of conditions uh, that the applicant had to satisfy. There were some comments from the town engineer that were fairly lengthy. Uh, public access easements had to be submitted and approved by the town attorney. Um, there were some notes about driveway widths and trees which were preserved and that they had to come back to this board specifically for the exterior appearance review that we're undertaking tonight. And there would be no commencement of work or building permits issued until all of those conditions were satisfied. So although we're only talking about one aspect tonight, I think there are other conditions that were already captured in the site plan review that will also need to be satisfied before this project can go forward. That is correct. In my mind, it, I think our scope of review is limited to just the, the paragraph in the original approval that said we have to look at the outside of the building and, and satisfy ourselves that it meets the requirements of the town center district. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Uh, 
I, I lean to interpret this in the, in the same direction, and uh, far be it from me to take issue with a uh, superior court justice. But the first sentence of condition number four states that our duty is to review exterior treatment, including exterior materials, roof pitches, window openings, and dimensions. The, the shell of the building, if you will, does not mention landscaping and site work at all because that's already been presented and covered. And then the second sentence of condition number four says that that exterior treatment has to be consistent with site plan and town center design standard and that says nothing about landscaping either. Uh, so it does not seem to me that Starting a new review of the landscaping of this project uh, is uh, part of uh, what we should be doing right now. Any other discussion at this point? I have, I have a question uh, for the applicant. Perhaps you could res refresh my memory. Um, the uh, new elevations that we have show some uh, some lighting over the the new entrance uh, coming in off of right uh, off of the street. Uh, was there any other exterior site lighting or or parking lot lighting there's shown a, on the original application? Yes, there's a lighting uh, there's lighting on the uh, in the sockets of the, yeah, the thing. I mean, pole lights, wall and there's pads. there's one pole light in the back. And one pole light. And that one and that pole light was on the original application? That is correct. And it's a pole light with a cutoff fixture such okay. that uh, the, there's no, no obvious oh. light at the property lines. I just, I guess in, in terms of the discussion of, of what other items and concerns there are about the final outcome of the built project, uh, my assumption would be that uh, the design standards for town center have specific requirements about lighting, uh, minimum, maximum level of foot candles at the property line and types of lighting. And uh, if there's any lighting that uh, is not shown on the plans, it's not approved. And uh, if there's any other lighting desired by the applicant, uh, then that would have to come back to, to this board, I would assume. Green. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the lights that you've just added above the entrance weren't on the original site plan. That's correct. They're right. in response to uh, the lights above the, the, the front door was, was a response to the, the concern that uh, was expressed by the town planner with respect to making this entrance make sure it would look like, a, like the main entrance. So the site plan requirements do have specific requirements for lighting and I think I don't want to be, it's going to sound like I'm splitting hair so what the heck um, I think the lighting was added above the doorway to try to meet the requirement that you have a distinctive front entrance and because the condition that the board is looking at is the exterior to make sure it complies with the town center requirements I believe that you could still approve entrance lighting without opening up the whole site plan review process and lighting for the site, if that's what you want to do. Uh, in looking at the elevation, it appears that the two lights over the Ari Ben Center sign are, uh, are, are some type of a, a shielded type of light. Yes, so just direct light down onto the right. sign and the sidewalk right there. Uh, and I think it's a, a, a positive uh, change. Uh, the design of the porch itself looks like it's uh, changed a little bit, but now sort of more clearly is a porch which faces the street uh, and is less uh, uh, and doesn't have the, any of the orientation toward the high school driveway, uh, which it had before. And this looks like it makes it more positively relates to the streetscape in front of the building and reinforces the entrance. If I, if I might, I think that was, that drawing was a earlier one, not the, not, the final, not the final final drawing. The final approved drawing did have it exactly like, like was on the on the on our plan now.
And has, have there, has there been any uh, further uh, thought uh, about the, uh, the sort of treatment of the shingle siding and, uh, and the sort of uh, impression that it would give? I, I think that the, uh, the overall sense, again, my memory is not all that clear, but I remember the sort of brown tones of the colored elevation and thinking of something that had maybe more of a lodge type of recall. And, and now it, it definitely looks like it's more of a New England sort of uh, New England town type of uh, palette of materials, which I, which I think probably fits in a little bit better. But in terms of color scheme or anything like that, have you had any further thoughts about uh, a, a direction for that? No, we haven't talked about color other than what we did at the board before. I think we're looking at fairly neutral colors with some contrasting trim. Um, um, and I think that one of the questions that was raised by the board before uh, in, in its desire to review this was to make sure when we did all the, all the detailing of the corner boards and stuff that they would be proportional and, and with, with this scale operation. And I think uh, once you put all those things in and, and dimension them rightly so we know we have uh, trim boards that are that are one shade and the and the and the, and the shingles are another shade it, mm -hmm. it comes kind of alive as a as a New Englandy kind of a building. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any further comments? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Sir. Mr. Carter? In regards to some of the comments we received from the public tonight, I was a member of the board when this was originally proposed and approved. Uh, I can remember in regards to landscape design at that point in time, two years ago, we had a member of the board who was a landscape architect, <clears throat> and for about a 45-minute process, he asked detailed questions of the applicant and their staff in regards to placement of trees and saving of mature trees and buffering uh, so that he could become assured that uh, the town center ordinance in regards to landscaping design and buffering was met. Uh, after that discussion, I was very confident in agreeing that it was. Uh, the lighting issue, I think, can be handled with just a comment we received tonight. Uh, signage, uh, it has previous approval. There's no need to discuss that. And I can only caution the board that we honor the previous uh, decision of the planning board and that we not open this up for further discussion except as proposed in the motion uh, that we are considering this evening, uh, because I think uh, we may open ourselves up to the challenge of ending up back in Superior Court again. I don't recommend that. It was very costly last time, and we won. And I think we should leave it at that. And uh, unless there's further discussion, uh, I request that the board consider the motion before us. Thank you. Any further comments? A motion. Mr. Chairman, I have a motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the building permit plans of Thomas Tinsman for the Urban Center located at 349 Ocean House Road be approved. I don't believe there's any need for condition number one. It has been met by the revised plans of the applicants submitted this evening. The motion's been made. Uh, do I hear any comments or discussion? Do I hear a like second? I'd like second the motion. I'm sorry. The motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further comments? Hearing none, then I will present it for vote. All those in favor, please show by writing, raising their right hand. The motion has carried. You have your approval, sir. Thank you very much. You're welcome. The fourth item on our agenda this evening is a uh, uh, request by Eric and Lisa Hansen for an amendment to the previously approved Ocean, Old Ocean House Road subdivision and resource protection permit located at Old Sea Point Road to uh, create an additional lot and widen the road. <coughs> Mr. Hansen. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Steve Dome, a landscape architect with Sebago Technics. 
and with me tonight is Eric Hansen. Um, I guess I'll just go through the project briefly. Uh, we did present this in April to the, as a concept plan to get the board's input. Um, this project was originally uh, before the board, I believe back in uh, 1990s, um, late, early 90s. And it was a subdivision of a piece of land and it was broken out into two parcels. There was a parcel up here and then a parcel over here. Uh, at the time, a house was constructed on it, which is where the Hansons currently live. That project went through, got its approvals, and now uh, uh, Eric is looking to come back and subdivide his piece of land, which is about 7.6 oh, acres, uh, and splitting that into two lots. Um, what he would do is he would live in the back lot, which actually has frontage on Route 77, and then he'd create another lot, which would uh, have frontage on Old Ocean House Road. Currently, the two existing lots are accessed by um, a driveway on a common um, easement. Uh, there's a driveway that heads off here to the abutting lot, and then it continues on to uh, Eric's house. This new lot would actually have the whole easement on that new parcel. At the time when this was approved, this was a 16-foot gravel driveway. Um, we've met with the fire chief and based on the comments from the board at the sketch plan, there was concern about protection for uh, getting fire trucks in and out there. So we've come back, we've widened it to 18 feet and it'll be a paved surface with shoulders on it. And down at the end at Eric's house, he has an existing little uh, parking area there that will be widened um, to accommodate fire truck movement in there. Um, there was a comment by, um, I believe, um, town engineer that it requested that it meet the town standards for subdivisions. We have revised it um, to meet those standards would be in a 40 foot in length, uh, 20 foot in width, and then have 20 foot radiuses on that. There was another uh, comment um, made about the septic system. Um, it apparently did not meet the town standards. We have talked with a uh, code enforcement officer and have resolved those issues. Uh, that dealt primarily with the licensing of our uh, soil scientist and he wanted to see some boring information of the soil test pit. So that was provided to him uh, today. Um, there was also a couple of waivers that we were requesting. Um, the first one is, um, which I had outlined in a letter to Maureen um, June 1st, is um, there's a requirement that all subdivision plans be at a one inch equals 40 feet. Um, we would request that our drawing, which is what's shown here, is at one inch equals 50, uh, so we can keep the drawing or the subdivision on one drawing. If we go to one inch equals 40, we're going to be looking at two sheets uh, to accomplish the two lot subdivision. That gets very complicated uh, going to the registry of deeds. The original project uh, that was approved was at one inch equals 60, and that waiver was requested and granted on that one. Uh, the second waiver we're requesting is. Uh, um, the surface drainage, um, basically a stormwater report. We have provided uh, contours and uh, drainage arrows and a narrative describing how the stormwater is going to be handled. Uh, basically, it's a very simple project. Um, we're probably looking at one additional house lot. The whole property pretty much drains down to a wetland area over here where it's naturally detained and then it exits out through a culvert. Um, into a little drainage ditch out Old Ocean House Road and then into the, the tidal areas. So that was a request we had and there was some comments by the, the town engineer that he was satisfied with, with um, our request. Um, getting into the resource protection performance standards, there were some waivers we were requesting in that one as well. Um, the first one deals with topography, given that the site is very small and um, the, the requirement was for one foot contours in lieu of um, oh, what we're providing is 20 foot contours, which is based on USGS topography. The uh, next waiver um, deals with the wetlands. We have performed a wetland survey based on um, 1987 Federal Manual for Identifying and Delineating uh, Jurisdictional Wetlands. And those are identified, the only wetlands we found was a large wetland down here at the lower portion of the site and there was a little pocket wetland over there. 
Um, we also had a high intensity soil survey done back in the, the early 90s for the project. And based on those two uh, items that we've submitted, we've asked for a waiver of uh, actually identifying the vegetation of the wetlands in kind of in a narrative format. And the last one, um, under the resource protection, performance standards deals with uh, the stormwater management plan, which I discussed earlier. Um, so at this time, I guess, if the board has any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions regarding the completeness or any questions you might have on some of the items that they waived? When did you say you submitted the information regarding the septic system? That was today. We actually had a phone call to Bruce Smith. Um, apparently he wasn't uh, familiar with the soil scientists we have on staff. Um, so he needed to see some licensing information from him as far as his, uh, I think, the actual license. Um, so we faxed that over to him. And then he wanted to see the borings of the soil um, that were performed. Um, the HHE 200 that we submitted did have those in there. Um, but I think there was some additional information he needed to see on that. So that was forwarded to him. And I don't know if, Maureen, if Bruce has talked to you, but... Um, It sounds like the applicant doesn't have a problem with the conditions um, be, because we don't, I don't have it in my file yet. I would ask the board to leave the conditions as proposed and we can just finalize the stuff that needs to be submitted. I have one question uh, on that wet, the wet area down at the end of the driveway close to Ocean House. What is the distance from that to the present road surface, the edge of the road surface? Down in this area? Yes. It's, I'm going to say it's pretty close to the bottom of it, probably within a neighborhood of 10 feet of the existing. And we're going to be expanding um, the road to that basically in the direction of the, the wetland, because we're restricted, there's a, uh, uh, right in this location is an existing uh, water meter pit, which serves the two houses. So we can't push the road in that direction because it's within a foot or two of the edge of the pavement. So the only direction we can come is this way. Um, and we're gonna be adding, uh, which is 12 feet now, we're gonna go to 18. And then right in the area where the wetlands are, we're gonna go with a riprap slope to minimize that impact. Um, so we'll keep coming down like a one-to-one -one slope. So the impacts in the neighborhood of 430 square feet, 452 exactly. Okay. Any other questions on completeness at this point? I, I had another question on the plans. Do I understand from the application that currently the utilities are underground, but they the are. new lot would be served by overhead utilities? They will overhead be underground. Electrical? They will be on, the electrical will be underground. I'm sorry. Would the electrical will be underground to the new house site. And they're currently underground existing. Okay, I thought I had read in the application or in the letter that came with it that there would be utility poles installed for electrical service. That might have been an error on my part. They will be underground. Any impact on the wetlands from that additional underground utility? No, because they typically would travel under the road service surface or to the, um, they'll either come under the road or come um, to the north of the driveway. So there won't be any additional impacts on that. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, I was absent from the uh, workshop meeting when this was first presented and wasn't really familiar with the project. And uh, now that I'm being presented with the uh, uh, scope of work of the project, I feel that I should recuse myself from actually discussing and uh, voting on the application uh, due to my own proximity uh, to the site, uh, so I guess at this at this point I would uh, I would prefer uh, to be recused before Does this any, comes to a vote. Anybody have any concerns with Mr. Wilcox's uh, request? We're right, the the mark, we'll... We're right around the corner. 
I will uh, excuse you then. Thank you. Uh, any other questions regarding the completeness part of this uh, presentation? Mr. Chairman, if there is no further discussion, I have a motion. Please. Motion for completeness be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Eric and Lisa Hansen for an amendment to a previously approved subdivision and a resource protection permit to create an additional lot and widen Old Seal Point Road in the area of 20 Old Seal Point Road be deemed complete. The motion's been made. Uh, do I hear a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, do I have any discussion regarding the motion? Just a point of clarification, I believe it's C Point Road, Old C Point Road. Thank you. Hearing no further discussion, I raise it to a vote. All those in favor, show by raising their right hand. The motion carries unanimously. A portion of completeness is behind us here. Um, um, at this point, if you want to continue the discussion regarding the uh, completeness, uh, we need to address the issue of a site walk and a discussion of um, need for a hearing. Has there been any public input on this project? Um, I did have a gentleman who lives to the north of the property come in and ask to see the plans. Uh, he didn't express serious concerns about it. And I believe the abutter to the south of the project is in the room this evening. So I don't, I've not heard anything specific in terms of objection. I believe the abutter to the north also was at the sketch plan um, hearing. Does anybody on the board uh, mind if Mr. Jordan made a comment if he cared to? Mr. Jordan? I have a problem with Well, it appears that, uh, that uh, the butters, the butters would be probably be the only ones that would be at a hearing. And, doesn't appear as though uh, there's any interest in that, unless you folks feel as though it's important. Uh, I'd like to discuss also the, whether you feel uh, we ought to do a site walk or not. Peter, you uh, see a I need to. Do not see a need for a site walk for myself, no. It seems pretty straightforward to me, um, so I don't feel the need to visit the site myself. Mr. Sorolo? No. I guess at this point, uh, we could accept, uh, uh, we could move along on this at this point without the need for a site walk or a, or a hearing. Is there any further discussion on the project? I'd like a little more clarification on the legalities of the maintenance agreement, if you have any updates on that particular piece. Do you want to discuss that, Eric? <laughs> uh, basically, I, I, I should have grabbed it with a neighbor and spoke to them. Would you come to you? Sure, yeah, please. Oh. Identify yourself. Yeah, uh, Eric Hansen. Good evening. I um, spoke to the neighbors last night about a maintenance agreement. A few it, today, what we have is we have it in the deed that you know we have to maintain the driveway, and um, my attorney is proposing that we we continue that with the other lot. Um, if that's not acceptable, my my neighbors will sign a uh, an agreement, a maintenance agreement. So I, we have in front of us, and I don't think it's a. It's it, it's not private, but there is a letter from our town attorney that might help you in your thoughts in that endeavor. Um, he brought the subject up in his uh, comments to us, and it may be helpful to you. Is, is that what you had in mind? Yes. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Hanson, the, the, uh, the letter that you submitted from Attorney Anderson suggests that since this is a private road, the town really doesn't have to concern itself with the specifics of the maintenance agreement. Mm -hmm. And the town attorney said, well, if you read the regulation specifically, it says that if a resident, if an owner of a private road fails to maintain it for emergency vehicle access, et cetera, the town can come in there and take care of that and then try and yeah. recoup the cost. So the town attorney is suggesting that the maintenance agreement should be in the form that's currently used and acceptable by the town. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that would create any undue hardship for you, but uh, certainly that's one of the conditions we would consider in, in an approval of your project. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, I don't think that's going to be a problem at all, um, and that's fine. Okay. We're, we're perfectly happy with emergency vehicles coming <laughs> up to our house to put out fires and so forth. I think so. that you would be, yes. Yeah. Any other discussions? Any other comments? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to offer a motion. Go right ahead, Mr. Charles. Motion for approval. Findings of fact. One. Eric and Lisa Hansen are requesting an amendment to a previously approved subdivision and a resource protection permit to divide their lot, R2-18-1, on Old Sea Point Road into two lots and widen Old Sea Point Road to 18 feet. Two, Old Sea Point Road is a dead-end road which requires a turnaround of sufficient size to allow town emergency vehicles to reverse direction. Three, the new lot will be served by a subsurface disposal system which must be designed in compliance with the town sewage ordinance. And four, the plan substantially complies with section 16-2-5, amendment to a previously approved subdivision, and section 19-8-3, resource protection permit. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Eric and Lisa Hansen for an amendment to a previously approved subdivision and a resource protection permit to create an additional lot and widen Old Sea Point Road in the area of 20 Old Sea Point Road be approved subject to the following four conditions. One, that the turnaround be redesigned in compliance with the subdivision ordinance standards and that the revised plan be submitted to the town engineer for approval. Two, that a revised HHE form 200 for the subsurface disposal system which complies with the town sewage ordinance be submitted to the code enforcement officer. Three, that a road maintenance agreement be executed in a form suitable, I'm sorry, in a form acceptable to the town attorney. And four, that there be no building permit issued or alteration of the site until the above conditions have been met. A uh, motion's been made by Mr. Charles. Do I hear a second? Um, I guess just discussion first. The, it doesn't appear that the condition regarding the maintenance agreement or the town's ability to seek reimbursement is included in the motion. Is that right? That was the, yes, the extra piece added, that I added. added. Yes. yes. Uh, the right, can, can I hear it again? Can a I road maintenance that? agreement be executed in a form acceptable to the town attorney. Okay, um, road maintenance, maintenance agreement with the, own, the applicant, right, be acceptable. The town attorney is making the distinction between the maintenance agreement that the town could require with the applicant as opposed to the maintenance right. agreement that the so, town can't require with the other. Uh, so rather than get into the specifics of what that would be, if we specify that it's in a form acceptable to the town attorney, then he'll make sure that it, it complies with the town ordinance. All right. Yeah. As, as a condition to this application. Right. Yeah. Which, would you reread that again? This is condition, new condition number three that a road maintenance agreement be executed in a form acceptable to the town attorney. Yeah. That, that's okay. Yeah. Do I get a second on that? I'll second. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion that's been made and seconded, uh, please show by raising your right hands. Motion carries unanimously. You have a approval this evening. Thank you. Contingent on.
The uh, fifth and final item that's before us this evening is a request by the Town Council to comment on a proposed amendment to the zoning ordinance that would delete the historic provisions to the historic resource zoning amendments. Um, I just wanted to make sure you had a chance as members to review um, the change in scope of this amendment and it's slightly different than our discussion at the last workshop. Yeah, I, I think at this time uh, I would like to turn to Maureen O'Mara to bring us up to date on the changes so that we're clarified on this issue as it stands in front of us right now. I'm going to refer you all to the national focal sheets in front of you. Um, it was my sense that the board only wanted, excuse me, only wanted to consider amendments that were already uh, requested by the council. Uh, it was my understanding that the entire section, both the archaeological resources and the historic resources, were requested to be deleted. Uh, and that was my error. Uh, the council only has requested that the historic resources section be deleted. So what you have in front of you is uh, the revised amendment that would keep the archaeological section and only delete the historic resources section, which is section B. Are there any questions? At this time, um, I think it would be appropriate to open the meeting to a hearing, public hearing. So if there is anybody in the audience that would like to speak on this subject, I welcome you to come to the podium and introduce yourself at this time. Members of the Planning Board, I'm Carol Fritz. And I just wanted to give you <clears throat> some of my perspective of having served on the Historic Preservation Study Committee and some of the things that we did. I know you've read the report, but um, just, just to review a few things. Um, we did a tremendous amount of gathering of information in that committee. Um, we held three forums uh, presenting information to the public helping the public learn about the, the, the historic resources they have in the town, proposing various options for regulations that we had studied, and also we had a survey done of, of our housing stock, our, our building structures, and presenting the results of that. Um, we also did a survey of the public, um, and I think we got quite a large response given um, you know the, the response rate you get from surveys like this um, the survey had 250 responses from people in Cape Elizabeth and 93 percent said that they were interested in historic preservation 85 percent said they thought the town should protect historic structures and 76% thought that there were buildings in the town that were worth saving. 42% wanted voluntary measures, and 47 wanted the town to regulate. Um, this was a rather generally question, uh, the questions were quite general that we asked the public. Um, we did want to ask some more questions, um, but it is costly to put a flyer in the, in the Cape Courier and the town council didn't want to seek any more information uh, by way of survey. Um, so we, I think that was very important information for you to consider tonight as to whether there's um, some interest in the town uh, on preserving historic structures. We also hired a consultant to 
uh, look at the list that's currently in the ordinance that applies to the 45-day waiting period you're talking about tonight. We knew there were inaccuracies in the list and that the list didn't include many structures that might be considered significant. Um, and we also felt that it was a, a way to um, authenticate any list that, that was proposed because these were experts in historic uh, evaluation and architecture. Um, we, we did extensive studying of ordinances. We did an unlimited search on the internet. Maureen has to be very much credited with all the kinds of proposals that we considered that are being used across the country for historic preservation, both voluntary and, and regulatory. Um, the committee met with the town council and we got a clear message as a committee that the council really only wanted to consider things that were more or less incentives that were educational and that were voluntary. And so our report to the council really reflects that perspective. All the measures are voluntary. Even though we included a written ordinance that we had worked on, it was not recommended. It's just that we didn't want our work to be lost in case it was needed one day. Um, our recommendations included updating that current list to reflect the consultant's opinion of the significant structures and also to update that list so that it included structures that might have events or people related to those structures. Um, also, we recommended that during that 45-day waiting period that the town could have a committee of people who knew about architecture and historic structures or possibly we could provide a consultant for them to uh, listen to and, and consider uh, recommendations. We also proposed a manual that would educate homeowners of these significant structures um, so that they would be educated on how to care for their property so that the significant portions of their property didn't deteriorate needlessly. Um, the council did talk about um, the cost of some of these things and at the point they considered um, some of these educational proposals, we were receiving some rather bad news on the revenue side and we were beginning to go into the budget process and I think they did not want to spend a great deal of money at that point. But if we get rid of a 45 day waiting period and then the time comes when we do want to do some of these educational things, there won't be anyone to apply them to. Um, so I think that um, also given the fact that the comprehensive plan, one of the items that's recommended in the plan, is that the town of Cape Elizabeth needs to preserve significant historic, historical and archaeological sites in the town. It does refer a lot to some of the very major national and state significant properties like Portland Head and Spurwink Church and things like that, but it also mentions that, um, that any list of significant structures determined by a local committee should also be considered. Uh, I think this would be a very big step back to take the 45-day delay out of the ordinances. Um, two Lights, I think, is the big example that we know about. They obviously took 45 days and then ended up doing exactly what they wanted to do with the structure. But we might be able to save some. People would still have a voluntary ability to, at the end of 45 days, not pay any attention to what has been suggested, but I think it could turn people around as well. So I hope that the planning board will recommend to the town council that the 45-day demolition delay remain in the ordinance and that the list be revised as suggested by the Historic Study Preservation Committee. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Hi, uh, my name is Hillary Bassett. I'm the executive director of Greater Portland Landmarks. And I'm really pleased to be here today. It's the first time I've been in the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall. And I did learn recently that it is a building designed by Frederick Thompson, who is a noted architect in this area. So I'm, it's a real privilege to be here. And I'm very glad to uh, meet you all and have the opportunity to speak. I'm here today on behalf of Landmarks to reinforce a letter I sent to you today urging you to keep the 45-day waiting period before a demolition permit is issued for all or part or any part of a historic building in Cape Elizabeth. Landmarks trustee Mary Murray Coleman, who is a Cape Elizabeth resident, uh, could not be here tonight. She's asked me to speak in her behalf. Cape Elizabeth has expressed a strong interest in preserving historic properties, significant historic properties in its comprehensive plan and has conducted an extensive examination of preservation options through the Historic Preservation Study Committee. The town has also invested in a professional survey which identified 199 properties of architectural significance. We deeply commend these efforts. It was a tremendous amount of work. Now is the time for you to build on the hard, this hard work to identify and protect historic properties. Please don't eliminate the demolition delay uh, which provides an opportunity for public notification and comment and for developing, potentially developing an architectural solution that meets both the owner's needs and also preserves historic character. Without this window of time, Cape residents may not even be aware as the town slowly loses its historic fabric and an important part of its community identity. I encourage you to reject the proposed amendment and to retain the 45-day demolition delay pr provision. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. May I ask you a question while you're up here? Uh, maybe somebody else has some questions also. But I was just kind of curious as to what, what are some of the uh, other restrictions that you see in other towns around seeing where you're in landmarks or there any similar agreements as this? Uh, well, certainly the, the demolition delay is, the, is probably the first level of protection for historic properties. In Portland, for example, we just did a, a kind of a timeline of the history of preservation in Portland, just beginning with the famous loss of the Union Station. I think you've all seen that photograph with that tower toppling down. And one of the most significant developments in uh, uh, really getting the opportunity to preserve historic buildings was a demolition delay provision in Portland. And there is a building standing today, which you all may know uh, as the Tracy Causer building. It's, um, I'm trying to think what the business, the Cotton Street ca Cantina is behind it. Uh, the front part uh, uh, contains, a, I think, a coffee house and an ice cream um, um, uh, store, but that building would, would clearly have been lost had it not been for a demolition delay. As it turned out, because it survived, and it survived in very bad condition for about 10 years, but ultimately there was time for a private developer to come forward with a reasonable and sustainable plan to restore that building. So what ended up happening was instead of that whole block being, you know, flattened, that, that piece, the Tracy Causer building, is still with us, and it's had a very successful redevelopment. It incorporates uh, a new infill structure between an, uh, the old stable part and the, uh, the main building. So I, I think the key thing there was the fabric wasn't lost, and it wasn't lost because there was time uh, to discuss it and consider other options. And I think that's what the demolition delay does for you. I think Carol uh, you know, stated, uh, stated the situation with the two lights where ultimately if the property owner currently feels, feels strongly that, that the recommendations of the community or the input from the community is not something he or she wants to follow through with, you know, they still can do what they want with their property. But at least if you've got that 45-day comment period, you have an opportunity for town residents to become aware that something might be lost, they have a chance to comment, and there's an opportunity for consideration of other options, and which might be to the advantage of everyone concerned. It might be, um, you know, might present the owner with options that they hadn't thought were available. So I, I think it's, it's a very powerful tool for you, and it still leaves your residents, their options are pretty open. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a window of time that's a very critical window of time to preserve your historic fabric. And Cape is, is just an amazing community in terms of what you've got. You, 
you know, I, I know uh, it would be a real shame to lose some of your major significant structures. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you very much. It. Are there any other presenters at this time that would like to make a presentation at the hearing? Hearing none, then I bring the hearing to a close. At this point, uh, I would uh, open it up for discussion with the board members if anybody had any comments or discussion. Well, I guess my sense of it is that the ordinance has, has not been uh, around and, and functioning for long enough for us to be able to say it definitely doesn't work and, and we don't need it anymore. I think it's been a fairly short period of time and it would be a mistake to judge uh, the effectiveness, if you will, of this ordinance by the one instance of the lightkeeper's house. Um, that's one example and one example where the owner chose not to uh, uh, heed any of the uh, advice or guidance given, but I don't think that's a fair assessment of the entire ordinance or whether CAPE should have an ordinance because of that one example. So I think it's too soon to to throw the whole thing out, or at least to even consider it, because we haven't had the benefit of seeing it work or, or not work, as the case may be, uh, for a long enough time. Thank you. I'd like to add my comments to John's, if I could. Um, I'd also like to add that um, 45 days um, certainly gets the owner's attention and it forces them to wait and consider and hear comments and I think that's very good. Um, I don't think it's uh, overly burdensome for either the town or the potential owner um, to administer this um, and I also would like to see it stand as written and I will not be voting for the amendment. Mr. Charles. A uh, couple of thoughts. Certainly with uh, some of the issues we've you've addressed in the last few months, property rights is an issue we need to, to think about carefully. Uh, and I agree with Karen that a 45-day waiting period, particularly when the structure being considered for demolition could be 100 or 200 years old, what's another month and a half. Uh, so I don't see that as being a, an unfair burden. And a, in the views of some people who've spoken or written to us, it, it certainly doesn't go far enough. I think also, We've, we've had a clarification tonight that we're being asked to consider removing only the historic resources portion of the current ordinance and leave the archaeological resources section in, uh, which to me adds a layer of additional inconsistency. Why would we want to wait 45 days before digging up an archaeological treasure but not want to wait 45 days before tearing down a structural treasure? Um, also, the, the historic... Preservation Study Commission made a, m a number of, of excellent recommendations, and it, it seems a shame to, to effectively ignore every one of them by eliminating the one piece of the ordinance right now that addresses some preservation. Uh, and personally, I would, I would be glad to work on a proposed change to the ordinance that would update the list of 89 to incorporate the 200 structures that were identified when the commission was doing its work. I would certainly appreciate a, a signal from town council that they'd entertain that before we invest a lot of energy in it, but I think that might be something that the planning board ought to consider. And uh, so I, I cannot support removing the ordinance as it stands. Any other comments at this point? I'd like to uh, make my comments heard, seeing where this subject has been, is kind of dead dear to me, having moved here from a town that uh, um, was very interested in preserving its character and its history, um, had a lot more stringent rules than, than, than appear in our present ordinance. And I feel as though um, as the town grows in age, uh, some of these things become very pop important to some of the older citizens. And uh, taking away this 45-day wait, uh, I agree with 
John sure all those comment it really hasn't been tested and it, it, it hasn't been brought to task at this point I see no reason to take it out of the ordinance so with those points in mind I will uh, uh, be voting to recommend that they not take that away from the ordinance is it uh, time at this point to make a motion or is it, do you have some other comments I guess I have one quick comment, Mr. Chair, before I make a motion. Uh, I'm a personal believer in the only thing that really results in any substantial changes is education. And I believe the 45-day waiting period will always, will always allow the town to educate individual property owners as to the value of their properties and uh, how they can modify some of their changes so that the value, historical value, uh, remains somewhat intact using the resources available to them such as Portland Landmarks. Uh, and with that in mind, I'd like to see the 45-day waiting period stay as part of our ordinance. With that in mind, unless Mr. Wilcox has a comment to make, motion for the board to consider, be it ordered that based on the information provided and the facts presented, the planning board does not recommend the adoption of the historic resources zoning amendment. A uh, motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Charles seconds it. Is there any further discussion? At this point, then, I'll bring it to a vote. All those in favor of the motion that's been made, uh, uh, please show uh, by raising your right hands. Uh, the motion carries unanimously that we will recommend uh, by a notification to the town council that we do not concur with the deletion of the 45-day waiting period. Uh, any uh, further business uh, before the board this evening that you'd like to discuss? I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion's been made to adjourn. Anybody want to second that? I'll second that. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, I assume that the meeting will be adjourned.